Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lee Ellis. I want to welcome you to the SWAG Plenary One session focused on translational medicine at SWAG and the SWAG Cancer Research Network. On behalf of my friend and colleague, James Ray, we hope you have a wonderful meeting and we hope you get to enjoy a little bit of Chicago. It's been a rough year, but it's great to get together again. And we hope you have a successful meeting and a good time seeing each other again. This is the uh, template that we have for our presentations today. After my short introduction, we will have a talk from the recipient of a Hope Foundation Award by George Thomas. We will then uh, highlight some of the translational medicine at SWOG. Uh, to, in today's plenary session, this will be in GI Cancers by Dr. Lenz and Dr. Liu. Uh, this will also be on the guts as they wanted to have in their title. And lastly, and importantly, we will have a uh, overview of biomarkers in the SWAG immuno-oncology trials from the co-chair of the committee, Katerina Politi. After each talk, I will choose questions from the chat box to ask the presenters. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll take the time to go through five minutes of Q&A and then we'll move on to the next talk. These are the presenter disclosures. I think it is important to leave this up here for a few seconds to make sure you have time to read through it. And I wanna start the presentation by talking about the wonderful opportunities and announcements from the Hope Foundation and also uh, highlight some of the recently funded awards. As you can see, there are a number of upcoming funding opportunities. The SEED uh, Award, uh, the deadline for the SEED Award is uh, December 1. We also have another December 1 deadline, which are the NCOR pilot grants. And since this is new, we will have group meeting office hours Thursday from 12 to 1. So please uh, sign up for that if you're interested in uh, submitting an NCOR pilot grant. The Charles Coltman Jr. Fellowship deadline is January 15th, and the SWAG Hope Foundation Impact Award deadline is also January 15th. So keep these dates on your calendar, and we hope to uh, see some wonderful applications. I'd like to congratulate all of those who have received awards from the Hope Foundation supporting SWAG. Congratulations to Karen Redding, who has been awarded a SWAG Hope Foundation Impact Award. Also, congratulations to Kathy, Kathy Crew and Richard Ha, who have received uh, likewise an impact award from the Hope Foundation. Congratulations to Eileen Connolly, who has received a SWAG Career Engagement Award. Uh, these are all outstanding uh, proposals, and I want to note the diversity within this group of proposals. And we have more awards from the Hope Foundation. Congratulations to Randall Holcomb, uh, who has been awarded a SEED award. Uh, congratulations to Patricia Robinson, who has been awarded the first SWAG DEI Career Development Award. And congratulations to Noel Ehring, who has also received a SEED award. So uh, best wishes to you all on uh, achieving your goals and aims within these awards, and we look forward to presentations in the future. And thank you to Hope Foundation for all you do for SWAG and its investigators and in turn, its patients. Now on to the uh, plenary session talks. The first talk will be by George Thomas uh, from OHSU on modeling novel combination treatments for kidney cancer. Uh, and then we'll have the translational medicine talk by Drs. Lenz and Liu. And then we will talk about immuno-oncology and biomarkers by Dr. Politi. With that, I wish you a wonderful and productive meeting. Uh, we hope to see you in Seattle sometime in the future. Look how beautiful that is. And we will keep you apprised of uh, virtual or real live meetings as soon as we uh, make a decision on that. Best wishes to you all and have a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much for inviting me to present our recently published findings that was funded very much by the Hope Foundation Impact Award. Our goal is very straightforward. 
what combinations synergize to kill kidney cancer cells? Now, it's a simple question, but a lot more difficult in practice. And so where we started was we assembled several kidney cancer cell lines, human kidney cancer cell lines, and we put them to a high throughput combination screen for about approximately 300 drugs. And from this screen, we applied several different filters and selected approximately 81 drugs to go to the next level. We then, from this, we further selected 28 drugs to go into a combination dose matrix whereby we would drill down specifically into combinations and be able to make calls on whether they were antagonistic, synergistic, or additive. And so the top part of this slide shows the actual workflow in terms of the cell lines, the screens, the selections of the drugs, and the combinations. And then and this is sort of the synergistic, uh, the Calcasin algorithm that determines if a combination is synergistic or uh, antagonistic. In the bottom half of the slide, what you see is that when we looked at multiple different filters, cabozantinib rose to the very top of the combination drug. And so we decided that cabozantinib should be the drug that we move into the secondary screen, including several other drugs. And here you can see that when we validated the combination of cabozantinib and disatinib across multiple different cell lines, you could see that it was highly synergistic. And this was also seen across different algorithms that we use to study to validate synergism, such as the Bliss algorithm or, or the Calcasin. And again, you can see here that cabozantinib rose to the top here and also here. So this then sort of gave us confidence that cabozantinib would be a good anchor drug to use in combination with disatinib. Moving into mice, we next demonstrated that this combination induced tumor regression as shown here by the waterfall plots. And that was pretty dramatic for us in that this combination was able to actually cause tumor regressions. And we also validated in vivo that there was target engagement in that you can see that the combination extinguished phosphomet and phosphosarc signaling, which are known targets of these drugs. Now, over the next few slides, I'll show you some genomic gymnastics that we perform to perhaps understand the mechanism underlying this response. First off, we performed phosphoproteomics. Since these are kinase inhibitors, it's, it was natural progression to actually do phosphoproteomics on this. And what we saw was that the, these drugs inhibited the unknown targets such as SARC and EXL and VEGF and MET. And the effect seemed to be much more dominant when you actually in the serine threonine kinase substrates. But at this point, it really didn't tell us anything that we didn't, we could not have already predicted. When we looked at the transcriptome of the co-treated cells, again, it kind of showed us things that we would have predicted in terms of there was enrichment for inhibition of the cell cycle, DNA replication, and pretty much pathways that you would have expected since there was tumor regression. And so at this point, we had phosphoproteomics and transcriptomics, but no novel mechanism to explain why this combination worked better than either drug by itself. Therefore, we then applied 
a, a, an algorithm to combine both the transcriptome and the phosphoproteome. And this is sort of a summary of the pipeline where you had the gene expression matrix, the phosphoproteomics matrix, and this kind of went through different enrichments, looking at master regulators and kinase enrichments. And we ran it through a, a, a program that we've used before for, to combine different data sets called the tie-dye analysis. And what this then gives you is an integrated network that you can perhaps use to identify new targets or perhaps understand mechanisms of response. Now, when we did this, we were surprised to see that this cabozatinib to satinib combination pretty much converged to downregulate the MAP ERK signaling pathway. Now, this was not something that we would have predicted. And we can see this in terms of when you have the inferred kinases, you can see that ERK is down here and different parts of the MAP kinase pathway are also downregulated. And really the proof here is in, the, in these Westerns where you see that either drug by themselves doesn't really inhibit or extinguish phosphor signaling, but the combination does. And so this was, gave us some sort of a mechanism that we could now interrogate further. We then extended this to a data set of about a thousand different epithelial cell lines. Uh, and applying this interactional, we again were able to show that our signature was enriched for MEK inhibitors. In contrast, our signature was not enriched for drugs that are at the other end of the spectrum, such as chemotherapy drugs. And if you look at specific drugs in the database that they had tested, our signature was enriched for MEK inhibitors shown here. So all of this sort of gave us confidence that the data that we had was interesting, but also the fact that it told us that we now had several different options for treatment. This then opened up the possibility that we could combine MEK inhibitors with either cabozantinib or desatinib using approved agents. Now, since cabozantinib was already approved in kidney cancer, we think this makes a lot of sense as the anchor drug to which we can combine either the satinib or a MEK inhibitor like cobimetinib and then use this now as the guide to which translate this to the clinic. And we're already exploring ISDs in terms of a cabozatinib cobimetinib combination. Thank you. I want to spend a few minutes now basically thanking the Hope Foundation and SWOG for funding me, and especially Jo Horn for her support. The funding that I received was transformational in terms of helping me set up the lab, get the data, which then enabled me then to apply successfully for several NIH funding programs, and also to work on projects, consortium projects with others. And so I do want to make a big shout out to Joe and also to Chris Ryan, my partner in crime here from SWOG, who pretty much guides me in terms of the clinical applications of our basic science research. As I said, the, this, the paper is published and this is the link to the paper. And these are all the different funding agencies that I receive funding from. Thank you very much. So thank you, George. Um, great work, great presentation. Congratulations on the award from the Hope Foundation and the nice comments that you made. Uh, Hope Foundation has certainly had an impact on so many people's um, careers, which in turn have affected, have positively impacted our patients. I do have a couple questions, especially knowing probably some of the people you work with out there, including uh, Gordon Mills, who, who left our humble place. 
Um, <laughs> it doesn't, uh, frankly, it doesn't really surprise me that Cabo and the Satinib uh, led to the results that you saw because you were targeting SARC and you've got two uh, drugs that are well characterized and um, CABO is used in renal cell carcinoma. Um, but what I would question is, what do you think the toxicity would be once you move this into a phase 1B trial? Uh, how would you know the patients tolerate the uh, dosing and the side effects, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's sort of been something that Chris Ryan and I have been thinking about. I mean, the, you know, the suggested also the dose that's used for CABO is about 40 milligrams per day. And that's probably kind of where we would anchor CABO at. And then in terms of Kobe, I think, we, you know, there'll be a little bit more sort of flexibility in terms of testing it. And, and one of the reasons, you know, where we sort of figured that Cabo and Kobe might be a slightly better combination is main, it's really more from a practical aspect in that they're kind of being made by the same company, uh, XLX and then Kobe Metnib is, is XLX's habit through some relationship with Genentech. So it just might be something clearer in terms of getting an ISD approved rather than having BMS and Exalexis come in. So there's sort of practical aspects that come into it that go beyond the science. But, but I certainly take your point that, you know, CABO is not a, an easy drug. And so it's, I think it's something, you know, based on sort of the biomarkers and stuff that we have, I think we hope we could sort of try to mitigate these. And, and, and in, a, in a phase one thing, as we go through a sort of a, you know, uh, looking at every three people in terms of dosing, they might be able to find a sweet spot. Well, thank you for that. And uh, it's quiet in the chat box in Q&A. Kathy Yang had a similar question to what I had. Uh, let me, um, doing similar type of work that you do, but in colon cancer, um, I'm sure, you know, you saw some nice responses in your mice, but you also saw a lot of tumor growth. And I'm, since you have the proteomics capabilities out there, what do you think the bypass pathways are once you treat them with the combination therapy? Have you looked into that yet? Uh, no, I mean, you know, we, I think the fact that this is sort of uh, inhibiting the MAP ERK pathway, that is sort of kind of where we're focused on. I mean, you know, the question is whether if you, if it's inhibiting MAP ERK, are you then sort of going to sort of, it will, the feedback loop sort of end up with a PI3 kinase or something. We haven't, you know, we haven't actually seen that in sort of different Westerns with, that we have done, but, you know, we haven't done it in a systematic way, but uh, I think we were just delighted that we actually saw tumor regressions, which is not something you normally see with kinase inhibitors. Yeah, I agree. It's <clears throat> certainly great to see that and patients will be pleased with that as well. Uh, assuming the toxicity is good, but then you're going right. to, you, you will eventually, as we all know, <clears throat> see a little bit of regrowth and right. um, it's, you know, you have the, like I said, you have the uh, scientific tools out there as well as your own passion for what you're doing to uh, try to figure out, okay, we have a second line therapy waiting for you. Uh, so I'm sure you're, you'll be on that. And I think we um, We'll now move to our second talk. So number one, congratulations, George. Number two, thank you to the Hope Foundation. And uh, number three, we look forward to uh, more progress in this area. So thank you for all you've done. Thank uh, you. Next, we will move to the uh, next presentation, which will be uh, uh, Heinz Lenz. Uh, by the way, Heinz Lenz just had a JCO paper come out. Uh, just a couple hours ago. So please go to uh, the JCO website or check your emails and note the paper that just came out on immunotherapy. And uh, Chris uh, may or may not be on the call as he is covering on the uh, clinical service right now, but we look forward to your talk. Uh, Heinz, uh, you have the guts and you have the podium right now. I would like to thank on behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Christopher Liu and myself, uh, Dr. Lee Ellis for the invitation to present the Translational Medicine Subcommittee in the GI Group. Our overview includes the Translational Medicine activities in our group entitled, We Have the Guts. We start out to talk about our achievements 
using tissue collections, blood collection in SWOG 80405, lessons learned from translational studies from two SWOG trials focusing on BWAF mutant um, metastatic colon cancer, and the new area of circulating tumor DNA to identify minimal vestigial disease. I think we are living in a really molecular revolution, and most of us are very familiar with genomics, looking at targeted panels, but more and more next generation sequencing panels are used. We have started to use transcriptomics. We are also now using proteomics. And I will show you some examples how new technologies and going beyond DNA will change the way we identify predictive and prognostic biomarkers and potentially develop better treatment strategies. When we dig a little bit deeper, what can we do with um, blood samples and tissue samples? not only checking DNA, but also RNA and microRNA and proteins, as well as circulating DNA or RNA. I will show you examples of NGS testing, but also RNA-seq, nanostring, qPPCR, and proteomics in order to show you how it can identify potential early recurrences for stage two and three disease, but also allow very unique real-time molecular monitoring um, in the setting of metastatic disease, but also identifying novel molecular-defined subgroups, which may benefit from very unique, specific, tailored treatment approaches. To give you kind of a flavor, this is actually using different technologies, including NGS testing, as well as transcriptome analysis, as well as one of our first finding of the predictive and prognostic um, value of primary tumor location. And you can clearly see knowing the mutation and its correlation with other mutations, but also the association with uh, consensus molecular subtyping based on gene expression profiling may characterize the subgroups very uniquely and therefore identify subgroups who benefit from very specific targeted treatment approaches. As you probably remember, um, with um, 8045 and FIRE3, uh, when Sebastian was, um, Stinsig was in my laboratory, we identified that tumor location was predictive and prognostic and become now part of the NCC guidelines um, as a use for treatment decisions. We, of course, are also very interested in the um, um, disparities in outcome in colorectal cancer and how we can potentially distinguish and identify different ethnicities with very unique molecular features. You can see here on the top the gene level mutations, the um, white patient population versus the African American, and down really looking at the specific mutations. And that has significant impact. You can see, for example, the G12C or the G12D mutations in KVAS, which are now being targeted by very unique small molecules, are completely different and more frequently seen in African American. Significant differences in frequency in P53 and KVAS and particular P3 kinase mutations may shed new lights in how we design maybe very specific treatment this, uh, outcomes for patients with different ethnicity backgrounds and may explain the differences in their prognostic value. To give you an, a, a flavor how important transcriptome analysis is, uh, our publication from 8045 looking at the consensus molecular subtype. You all are very familiar with it. CMS1 and CMS2 and 3 and 4 are uniquely characterized by biological distinct activated pathways. This was not trained for outcome. It was only trained for different activated pathways in these four different subgroups with the ultimate goal to identify and develop specific treatment options for these different subgroups. But when we look in 8405, we saw clearly one of the most powerful prognostic signatures we have seen with median survival ranging from 4, 15 to over 40 months. 
So it was highly prognostic. And it will make sense. Certain pathways are more significantly associated with prognosis than others. Now, we were completely surprised that it was also predictive because we have seen for the first time that CMS1 characterized characterized usually by MSI high and BWAF mutant and methylator phenotype, benefited significantly more from bevacizumab than compared to cetuximab. So we had also a predictive value, which will be very important. And particularly the CMS1 subgroup is important because of MSI high driven potentially by immune pathways, uh, which we all know benefit from immune checkpoint inhibitors and the potential synergism with anti-VHEF strategies. So transcriptome analysis will become important in the future. I think the limitation so far is that there was no clear approved laboratory which uh, allowed to have access for this testing of CMS. Now, it was a very important factor because we actually aligned with FIRE 3, used the same classification in order to better understand and validate the association of CMS classification and tumor location with outcome. And you can clearly see here that we were able to show a difference in progression-free survival um, and overall survival when we compare bevacizumab versus cetuximab. And this was confirmed in FIRE 3 as long it was locked at the left-sided tumors because that was a significant difference. We have learned a lot since then, and we have seen that CMS classification may be very important not only for targeted treatment prediction, but also for classical chemotherapy. This Lancet Oncology paper by Dr. Adarka showed that in CMS2, oxaliplatin is more effective, and in CMS4, ivinotecan is more effective. And these differences may explain the differences we have seen in the outcome between FIRE 3, where Fulfiri was used as a backbone, versus SWOG 8405, where Folfox was mainly used as a backbone chemotherapy. Now, we also know that the CMS classification has a very unique uh, immune signature um, correlation with the MSI high and the SIMP and the BWAF mutant, as well as the CMS4, which has a very significant inflammatory response through the TGF-beta pathway. So how can this help? Well, we just presented um, the data on using immune signatures, looking at the M2 macrophages, the TGF beta signaling pathway, the plasma cell pathway, as well as the CD4. And when we looked at these four pathways, we saw, similar to the CMS classification, significant prognostic outcome. This is in both arms actually all three arms, one arm was with dual antibodies, highly prognostic, ranging from 17 to 42 months. So that was very important. And I think would be not the first time that immune signaling and certain pathway would be associated with outcome. But I think what was incredibly surprising is when we looked at outcome in bevacizumab versus cetuximab. Bev on the left, cetuximab on the right. Only the MEM2 macrophage signaling pathway predicted the efficacy of bevacizumab. But for the cetuximab group, all four activated pathways impacted outcome. In fact, one of the subgroups did not even reach the median survival. So I think this is new insights. We were not aware how bevacizumab and cetuximab outcome could be determined based on activation of different immune signaling pathways. So I wanted to uh, finish up with the power of new technologies using um, next generation sequencing as well as RNA-seq. This was presented at ESMO in the oral session and it's now submitted to JCO. In the 8405 trial, we used for the first time an NGS panel in a first line metastatic disease setting with tumor tissue available. And you can see that we had significant genes related to outcome prognostically. Here, the LRP1B and the Zinc finger 703. And that was not surprising. But 
what was surprising, we found very for the first time genes associated with the survival in bevacizumab. And one of them is actually turned out to be LRPB1, uh, which is very important because this gene, uh, which I'm sure many of you probably are not familiar with it, if you knock it out in the zebra fish model, there is no angiogenesis. Much less is known about GRM3. We are looking more carefully into it. It may be linked to endothelial cell um, um, development, but uh, this is all new genes in new pathways which potentially could be useful in identifying patients who benefit from bevacizumab. But we also saw new genes associated with overall survival in the cetuximab app. The whole avid one um, family is very important and shown here significant association. When you look at the hazard ratio, it's over four, the same for SMARC CA4. So the SNF complex is very important for the efficacy of cetuximab treatment and may be important because there are no drugs developed which target the SNF complex. So what are, what are the lessons we learned from 8045? A trial which was negative. I think when we wrote 10 years ago that we wanted to collect blood and plasma and tissue, everybody looked a little bit weird to us because it was the first large trial where we used uh, an extensive tissue and blood collection protocol. I think it's very important to be able to prioritize translational projects and using evolving novel technologies. As we had collected this plasma, the protocol was not written for NGS and RNA-seq, it didn't exist. You need to be open-minded and make sure how you use effectively tissues in order not to waste tissue by doing immunosochemistry on 20 cuts, but potentially do multiplex. And we had a committee to make sure that these decisions are done the most effective way. I think that translational biomarker research, as I showed you, can be very critical to identify novel hypotheses which lead to a new generation of new clinical-driven or biomarker-driven studies. I think very important, we have an incredible resource with Nationwide who have worked us, with us very closely, became a very critical partner and supporter. So I can only encourage everyone who is writing a clinical trial to reach out to Nationwide and their incredible quality and capacities. So I would like to hand over to Dr. Lu to continue with the agenda on the TMGI session. Thanks so much, Heinz. And that's such a great overview of the translational studies done in 80405. And we're gonna continue this theme of lesson learned uh, from uh, several other studies, including SWOG 1406, which is, a, which is a BRAF study. We're also gonna move into how that's informed other trials and future trials. So we're gonna talk about translational biomarkers for a next generation BRAF B600E trial, which is SWOG 2107. So this is the results from SWOG 1406, and this is a study in metastatic BRAF B600E mutated metastatic colorectal cancer, where patients were randomized to receive either standard of care arenotecan and cetuximab, or that same combination with vemurafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor. And what you see here is that this is a positive trial with a statistically significant increase in progression-free survival. And this study was published actually this year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and it's a real credit to Dr. Kopetz and his colleagues in terms of the translational studies that were planned even prior to the initi initiation of the study. So here at the top of the screen, you can actually see uh, BRAF B600E testing by immunohistochemistry, next generation sequencing, and even ctDNA, which at the time of the initiation of the study was a little bit in, in its infancy. And as expected, most of these tumors are obviously BRAF B600E mutated, but you do see the capture of some wild type tumors. There is also RNA profiling done on these tumors, which allow for these studies that you see on this graph right in front of you where you can actually look at MAT kinase activation and see if there's a differential response, depending if patients' tumors were MAT kinase pathway high or low, or as Heinz had kind of mentioned about the consensus molecular subtypes, even that analysis was able to be performed on the study. And this is a real nice example of being able to look at some very, very interesting uh, features of tumors and see if there's a differential uh, in response. 
We had talked about circulating tumor DNA. Uh, this was also tested in SWOT 1406. And what you're seeing here is the level of ctDNA change at the control arm versus the treatment arm. And you see really big discrepant results between the control arm and the treatment arm with significant ctDNA decreases seen in a treatment arm. And again, uh, a very, very nice analysis from and some translational endpoints uh, from the study in addition to the fact that this study was a positive study. So this is the next generation uh, BRAF study. So this is being led by Dr. Van Morris, and this is SWOG 2107. And this is a randomized phase two trial of encorafenib and cetuximab with or without nivolumab for patients with BRAF B600E mutated metastatic colorectal cancer. And this is a, a two to one uh, randomization. And this is a slide from Dr. Morris in terms of the proposed translational studies. And so, you know, there's going to be an optional collection of patient samples, you know, with certainly the goal for all study participants at all sites, but to recover archival tissue for multiplex immunofluorescence, whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, but also blood collection, including blood collected in strep tubes, and then to be returned to the SWOG biobank for ctDNA profiling and even the storage of PBMCs. One of the really neat uh, you know, ideas here is this uh, you know, attempt at uh, achieving or getting optional paired sample collection. The goal is for 25 paired samples from selected sites and getting a pretreatment biopsy and an on-treatment biopsy. And I think the nice thing about this type of biopsy collection is that it allows you to see what the treatment is doing, not only to the tumor, but the tumor microenvironment, which again, may lead to more hypotheses and hopefully the next generation of trials. We're gonna wrap up here. We're circulating tumor DNA and colorectal cancer, and we're gonna talk specifically about applications in the minimal residual disease setting or MRD setting. And so when we think about circulating tumor DNA, these MRD or minimal residual disease applications are really enabled by very high positive predictive value, which means that they're low false positives, for recurrent disease in patients with ctDNA detected in the adjuvant setting. And so it's a real key thing to think about that this is not a marker of high risk or low risk as we typically think about clinical features, right? Like poor differentiation or T4 disease. ctDNA being present in the body really defines a molecular persistence uh, of disease. And really these patients should be thought of at, as actually having minimal residual disease in the stage four setting, as opposed to just simply being high risk. And this is really borne out by the data that we've seen in a lot of studies. And this is kind of what you see in multiple studies where if you are serially ctDNA negative, these are the patients that are certainly gonna do the best in terms of relapse-free survival. But if you're ctDNA positive uh, and you remain ctDNA positive, you basically have a 100% chance of having disease recurrence. And so this is certainly an area and a technology that we want to be able to utilize in clinical practice. Uh, certainly a sincere appreciation to everybody that was involved in the NCI Colon Cancer Task Force ctDNA workshop. This was back in ASCO 2018. And you see a picture here of a lot of people meeting face-to-face, -face, which is obviously something that we wish we could do right now. But uh, the group really came up and identified four key areas for the use of ctDNA in clinical trials. Certainly this idea of using it in the minimal residual disease setting even the monitoring of metastatic disease, detecting acquired resistance against targeted therapies, and as well as the use of ctDNA in rectal cancer. And so, you know, the real question kind of being, well, if we know that this test is so incredibly prognostic, how do we improve the outcomes for these patients? And so I'm pointing specifically to stage two disease here. And this is another study by Dr. Van Morris, the COBRA study, uh, where patients with low risk stage two disease that would normally not receive chemotherapy for their resected colon cancer are randomized to either receive standard of care observation or testing. But if they test positive for ctDNA, they actually get uh, assigned treatment to chemotherapy. If they remain ctDNA negative, then they're uh, selected for observation. What about the stage three population? This is the group that we typically give chemotherapy to. How do we improve the outcomes for these patients that, again, if they're ctDNA positive, have such an incredibly high rate of recurrence. And so this was actually a stage three study that was co-developed with SWOG and NRG, where patients with low risk stage three disease that would normally get chemotherapy, they get ctDNA testing after surgery. If no ctDNA is detected, they get randomized to either standard of care chemotherapy or surveillance with serial ctDNA. 
And if ctDNA is detected postoperatively or even in the surveillance period, they're then randomized to receive either standard of care chemotherapy or an escalation of chemotherapy with full foxerine. Certainly, whenever we uh, obtain blood from a patient, uh, there are certain things that are released into the bloodstream beyond cell-free DNA. And so I just want to point to some uh, research work done by Dr. Maggie Senthal in regards to tumor uh, exosomes. So exosomes are secreted by a variety of cells. And tumor cells produce more exosomes than normal cells and contain protein and, and a lot of RNA and can carry cell-specific markers. I think the thing uh, about exosomes and what's really interesting is that it's very stable. The exosomes are actually released by live cells, detected easily in biofluids, and it really doesn't require that much plasma to be able to detect exosomes. And Dr. Maggie Sento has actually worked with some of our investigators to utilize this type of technology as a translational endpoint for uh, future studies. So to wrap up, uh, you know, certainly I think that, uh, and Dr. Hein, uh, Heinz Lenz and I hope that uh, we've proven to you that tissue and blood acquisition certainly is critical. And a lot of this is just to not only inform what's happening on a clinical trial, but to also gain hypotheses that can inform the next generation of studies and integrate, obviously, the latest and greatest novel technologies. Uh, I think 80405 has really yielded a ton of insight into disease biology. Uh, both Heinz and I would state that it's certainly critical to pre-plan these analysis uh, during study development and work closely with the tumor bank so you know what you're collecting and why you might be wanting to collect them. And certainly, we want to appreciate everybody that's been involved with our quarterly TM meetings. And I think these multidisciplinary insights where we have a collection of investigators and even basic science researchers has really kind of helped these meetings be essentially an ideas meeting to help brainstorm new ideas. We certainly want to raise awareness about new preclinical models, new technologies, and even emerging biomarkers. And I think that, you know, this kind of multidisciplinary collaboration has really helped uh, with study design and hopefully will continue on into the future. Uh, thank you so much, and I think we'll be happy to take questions uh, after the session. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Heinz. That was absolutely magnificent. Uh, I'm going to say <clears throat> two words, wow and wow. So, and the reason I say that is you have this wonderful, wonderful science. So, wow, that's just fantastic. And then... I want to challenge you to say, how do we roll out this technology first in SWOG clinical trials that may be uh, uh, implemented at uh, community sites as well as academic sites? And then how do you roll out this technology to clinical practice? Because this is not straightforward, you know, uh, BRAF sequencing or whatever it may be. This is multiplex studies. How do you roll this out? So most of the data we have generated was actually using the tissue submitted in majority of community practices in 80405 to the tumor bank, including blood samples, including plasma collections. Um, we had no time today to talk about the biggest liquid biopsy studies we have ever done, which was 80405. These two papers are submitted showing completely new findings in the value of mechanism resistance. So NGS can be done on tumor samples collected anywhere. Um, the question is, can we integrate that in a daily clinical practice? Now, with different commercial companies available throughout the US, NGS testing becomes more and more routine. And sometimes the limitation is, um, is this test being paid for or not? And I think that is a completely different question to answer and maybe not in my power to answer it. I think most academic centers are now doing NGS testing for newly diagnosed patients. I think one of the limitations that CMS is not becoming available is because there was no clear approved approach because RNA-seq, there are only two laboratories in the country you have clear approved RNA-seq um, testing available. That will change in the future. And many companies who already offer um, transcriptome analysis in connection with NGS are able to easily do CMS classifications and need just to be cleared legally to do a clear approved 
testing uh, results. We now see in many reports, HLA typing, the immunoscore. So I think we will get more and more into it. Now, multiplex immunostochemistry is not routine yet. It will come, but newer um, information technologies and uh, artificial intelligence now can use, for example, RNA-seq data to have a better understanding on, on immune cell trafficking within the samples. We know if CD4s are there and CD8s are there or M1, M2, uh, and you saw some of the data today. So I think with more information, bioinformatic technology, we will take even more advantage of the data we can now generate on collected tumor tissues. So I think I'm very optimistic. I think it will be a challenge how to use really this complex data analysis on DNA and RNA, and eventually we will go to multiomics in order to make treatment decisions or identify minimal residual disease or um, uh, identify me uh, mechanism resistance. Sorry for the long answer, but I think um, it's not a short answer to address the complexity. All right, that's why I asked the complex question. So Heinz, let, let me ask you real quick, then I'll move on to uh, Chris and liquid biopsies. <clears throat> what is the concordance of um, RNA-seq and NGS, et cetera, between the various companies who would likely be doing this work probably wouldn't be done at a community hospital or even a, a, a university hospital, but what is the concordance of the various com companies, um, you know, determining the, the four CMS subtypes? So I have not seen a formal study, but the concordance is when you look between NGS and RNA-seq, that is actually very high. In fact, the RNA-seq identifies KVAS mutation um, in uh, signatures and downstream signaling in KVAS wild type. So we have seen and published that when you have activation of pathway downstream of the VAS signaling in wild type, they act like a mutant, which is very, because the signatures are reflective of a mutation signaling. Now, when you look at technologies of NGS from one company to other, there are different qualities how many genes are covered, how deep is the anal analysis. And so there are differences from one NGS platform to the other, but the concordance is very high for the most common mutations. It's more the platform and the panel which is covered may be different. I think RNA has a significant advantage, um, particular for fusions and amplifications, much more sensitive than the NGS platform. But I think there is no doubt in my mind that in the future, the transcriptome analysis and NGS will be combined to come up with a better molecular testing results, which will guide us much better in the clinic. Thanks, Heinz. So Chris, I think um, we are the SWAG Clinical Trial Network. We're not you know, out in the community uh, in private practice and so forth. Though we are out in the community, but the point is that we are here at SWOG to do clinical trials. Should we be collecting CT DNA on every patient, on every clinical trial uh, from every disease site? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I would say it's something that all investigators should think about collecting. You know, I think that the amount of information that we don't know about ctDNA or even how to utilize ctDNA is pretty vast. And you can see, you can start to see some clinical trials really start to answer the question of, you know, getting prognostic information from ctDNA, I, I think is, it's powerful, probably the most progno uh, prognostically powerful tool that we have ever seen in colorectal cancer and, and maybe even in cancer in general. Uh, but this, the simple fact is that we hate getting tests that we don't really know what to do with. And I think that the trials that you've seen being designed, at least within GI oncology, are starting to answer that question, but it's almost like the technology has outpaced our ability to understand how to use it. Um, I actually would encourage people to do this, right? Um, if you collect these samples and be able to look at ctDNA uh, quantitative data and to look at the kinetics of ctDNA over the course of treatment, that might be uh, very powerful. Uh, it's also um, a possibility, and there's emerging data regarding ctDNA in response to immunotherapy. And so, you know, these are all things that I think need further study. 
as uh, you think about trials being designed, uh, collecting blood is you know, oftentimes at least easier and sometimes cheaper uh, and should be considered in every study designed for translational medicine projects. So there's some activity in the Q&A uh, chat box, if you will. Uh, I'd ask you to take a look at that. And Sapna Patel talked about not using strep, uh, strep tubes uh, because it's too expensive and Heinz agreed. So if you were uh, doing a clinical trial or you had a patient that uh, let's say was, you know, stage three colon cancer seemed all, you know, seemed to be clear, but you really weren't sure whether or not to uh, start adjuvant chemotherapy on, how hard is it to uh, collect and bank ctDNA? Yeah, I mean, I, and I'll let Heinz, you know, weigh in on this as well, but I agree. I mean, I, I think the strep tubes themselves can be uh, expensive, but, um, you know, there are also, I think, emerging technologies in regards to being able to measure uh, ctDNA and, and, uh, and other things, right, that are kind of excreted within the blood uh, without necessarily the use of strep tubes as well. So, you know, store blood when you can, uh, and you, if you have the ability to collect and strep tubes, I mean, obviously, if you have the ability, you should be able to do it or should do it. And last question, which we all know the answer to, uh, as you're planning these clinical trials, how early do you get your statistician involved? <laughs> From the beginning. <laughs> I, From be I, that's the wrong answer. It should be before you even think about the trial. <laughs> your, <laughs> your statistician should be on board. I mean, this is critical. Mike, I hope you're listening out there. Uh, so um, this was fantastic, and I'm sure there'll be other questions for you all, and it's wonderful to see curves separate like that, and it's wonderful to see uh, the clinical trials emanating from earlier clinical trials at SWOG. So I want to thank you both for wonderful presentations, and um, Chris, you're here live, which is good. You're not in the clinic, so great that you were able to join us. So we thank you for that presentation, and we will now move to our uh, last presentation uh, for the plenary one session at SWAG, which will be delivered by uh, Katerina Politi, who is co-chair of the SWAG Immunotherapeutics Committee, and we will learn about biomarkers in our SWAG IO trials. Hello, my name is Katie Politi, and I'm a co-chair of the SWAG Immunotherapeutics Committee together with Siwen Hu Liskoven. It is my pleasure to speak today and tell you about uh, incorporating biomarkers in SWOG IO trials and some perspectives from the SWOG Immunotherapeutics Committee. These are my disclosures. During this talk, I'll start off by introducing the SWOG IO Committee, then talk about why we need biomarkers in immune oncology trials, and then leave you with some considerations on approaches to incorporating biomarkers in IO trials. The SWOG IO committee started off in July 2018. Ken Grossman and I were the inaugural chairs and held an initial meeting in Snowbird, Utah. That uh, in, in July of 2018. When Ken became chair of the SWOG Melanoma Committee, Siwen Huli Scoven took over as co-chair together with me starting in July of 2019. The objectives of the SWOG IO Committee are to facilitate the inclusion of translational studies into SWOG immunotherapy trials. It is uh, it is planned to be an immunotherapy-centric disease agnostic cross-committee and facilitate collaborations on toxicity monitoring, quality of life metrics, and patient outcomes, and is planned to facilitate collaborative efforts between the SWOG disease committees, the Cancer Immunotherapy Trials Network, the CMAX and uh, ASCO, ASCO Cancer Link Q representatives, the Jackson Labs, and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. Now, the committee plays a central role in the development and execution of the NCI initiated immunotherapy match trial, a cross NCTN trial led by SWOG. Here is a schema of the structure of the IO committee. The IO committee is composed of co-chairs and committee members, including members of the committee who uh, 
will be working, especially in the future, on uh, IMATCH uh, planning and planning different studies that are going to be part of the IMATCH study. It also incorporates an expert panel in immune oncology nominated by each disease committee and expertise across different histologies. So the idea is that the IO committee will work with the disease committees to facilitate IO-centric disease agnostic collaborations and work on IMATCH and other IO committee agendas interfacing with these different disease committees. It also will assist with IO trial concept and TM design and execution. The IO committee also interfaces with other groups, as I mentioned, the CITN, CMAC, ASCO Cancer Link Q, Jackson Labs, Cold Spring Harbor Labs, the SWOG Biorepository, and works with SWOG leadership on many of these initiatives. So why do we need biomarkers in IO trials? Well, primary and acquired resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors and immunotherapies in general are a major prom problem in the clinic with even in these cancers represented here on this schema that have significantly high response rates to immune checkpoint inhibitors, for example, the response rates are, are not 100%. So primary resistance is a major problem. And then as you can see, for all of these uh, cancer types, acquired resistance uh, occurs commonly and uh, is a major impediment to cures, even with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We've been learning quite a lot about the mechanisms of resistance to immunotherapies over the years, and we know that these can be uh, tumor cell intrinsic mechanisms. For example, one can have disruption or downregulation of antigen presentation machinery. Um, one can also have a loss of interferon uh, sensitivity in the tumor cells, neoantigen depletion. And also the tumor cells uh, can, uh, oncogenic pathways active in the tumor cells can uh, function to lead to an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. For example, some of these pathways or alterations in the P10 pathway or in the Wnt pathway have been linked to uh, immune exclusion by the tumor. Additionally, there can be uh, tumor cell extrinsic uh, mechanisms that can also uh, contribute to resistance. So these can be, for example, upregulation of immune inhibitory checkpoints, the absence of T cells that are required uh, for the immunotherapies to function, and the presence of other immunosuppressive cells in the microenvironment. So, the, the goals for using biomarkers in IO trials are really to understand which subsets of patients are most likely to respond to the therapy or not, to identify mechanisms of resistance. And to doing these things is really important to help us refine and optimize treatment approaches for individual patients. And so I'll give you an example of, uh, of why understanding uh, who, the subset of patients we're gonna respond or not and why identifying mechanisms of resistance is important. So for example, one of the major mechanisms uh, of resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors that has been identified over the years in various different uh, tumor types and uh, by various different mechanisms is downregulation or impaired MHC1 antigen uh, processing and presentation. Uh, this can occur in various different ways through uh, genomic loss, for example, of beta-2 microglobulin, which is essential for uh, antigen presentation and for the MHC uh, complex to be pres on, present on the, on the surface of cells. Um, one can, though, also have downregulation of MHC1 antigen presentation, for example. It doesn't have to be a structural uh, defect, but there can also be downregulation of the pathway. And so knowing what is happening in the tumors can be really important because the approaches to overcoming the resistance could be different in different situations. So you, if you have irreversible changes, for example, in MHC1, 
one would want to use MHC1 independent therapies, presumably to overcome the resistance. So activating natural killer cells, altering myeloid cells, using approaches like CAR T cells or, or, or different, different ways of engaging T cells with tumor cells. But if you have down regulation or immune inhibitory signaling that is affecting MHC expression, then that could potentially be a reversible process and other approaches to sort of inhibit that or to reverse that inhibition and then activate T cells could be useful. Cytokines blocking inhibitory signals or, or using other epigenetic drugs. So, 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 so understanding the resistance mechanisms and understanding uh, what is happening in the tumor is important so that we can plan and think about approaches to preventing or overcoming that resistance. But it isn't easy because tumor immune suppression is super complex. So in a tumor microenvironment, in fact, we have the tumor cells um, and there, there are many factors in the tumor cells, as I was mentioning before, that can contribute to whether an immune response is effective or not. Um, there are cytotoxic T cells and their infiltration, their activation is, uh, can also be critical for this. We can also have regulatory T cells, innate immune cells. Their abundance, their immunosuppressive properties are going to factor in whether an effective immune response can be mounted. Um, and then we have stromal cells, uh, fib fibroblasts, endothelial cells that also can uh, have provide immunosuppressive signals, can also modulate um, vasculature and uh, angiogenesis. And so what we're learning really is that individual biomarkers are rarely sufficient and that tumors are dynamic and extremely heterogeneous. Not only that, if we have individual immune checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapies, and we have to overcome all of these different elements that are present in the microenvironment. There also are many different IO combination therapies that could be used and that are possible. And where different biomarkers may be important to determine, to, may be important to assay with different types of combinations. And so this adds another layer of complexity as we think of incorporating biomarkers into uh, immunotherapy trials. So with that in mind, we've, we, we, we know that we need the biomarkers, but we have this very complex immune microenvironment and lots of different potential biomarkers that one can use. And, um, and then we know that we have lots of different drugs. And so how do, we, how do we sort of take this information and where do we start when we're thinking of using biomarkers in, and, and uh, incorporating them into IO trials? And this is where I can turn to uh, tell you about the ImmunoMatch trial. And uh, so the ImmunoMatch trial is a, a precision medicine platform um, that with that plans to have incorporate prospective molecular profiling into immunotherapy trials. And um, this is an NCTN effort. Um, and the idea is to have a central screening platform to provide prospective molecular profiling and triage patients for trials or for treatment arts. Patient stratification, can occur based on CLIA assays, like measurements of TMB, of inflammation, and also of actionable variants as we learn more about these. And there's flexibility to incorporate new markers when available. Multiple therapeutic trials will be developed to evaluate IO regimens in predefined molecular subgroups in this immunomatch study. And then a lot of information and will be collected through these studies that will allow retrospective studies uh, to discover new markers and optimize classifiers of these biomarkers that are, that are used. IMATCH will be a cross NCTN effort with um, 
SWOG leading the central protocol and with uh, all NCTN groups developing sub protocols that can be run under this central screening platform. And I'd like to uh, thank Helen Chen for providing uh, these slides on uh, iMatch. So what is the idea here of this precision immunotherapy study? Is that in many of the trials in the past, IO trials in the past and, and current ones, there really isn't uh, very much upfront patient or tumor characterization. But here in IMATCH, there'd be the prospective use of available markers for therapeutic trials in predefined molecular strata with additional analysis and deep tumor immune profiling that will eventually help guide us to the future where we can use uh, really precision biomarkers for individual regimens and combinations. So that's where we'd like to head with Immunomatch. Um, and definitely, I think one of the main um, features of IMATCH is that the current markers and cutoffs that we understand and that we know about now for some of these different biomarkers will need to be optimized. And this is something that uh, is allowed and, and can happen in the context of uh, the IMATCH trial. And so some of the initial ideas of how to structure uh, IMATCH, an, an IMATCH study, for example, is as a first step to have this central screening protocol where um, uh, assays, biomarkers are going to be assayed. They have to be CLIA level assays. And so as a first step, for example, NGS can be performed to calculate TMB, to look at specific uh, variants that we know are associated with immunotherapy sensitivity or resistance. Uh, gene expression uh, profiles uh, can be uh, measured to assay for um, degree of inflammation in the specimens and or analysis of PDL1 and other markers or assays can be incorporated as relevant. Um, in some of the initial uh, studies or the initial study that is planned, you'd really then be able to uh, subdivide groups of patients into different molecular subgroups based, for example, on the the levels of TMB and the gene, the inflammation signature present in the tumor. And then based on that, uh, treatment can be assigned by enrichment or stratification. So an example of a potential pathway for one of these trials involves, for example, um, enrolling patients who have developed a resistance or who have primary resistance, for example, to anti-PD-1 therapy. Uh, the tumor can be assayed to group them into the different subgroups um, and stratified, and then they can be enrolled on a trial of an anti-PD-1 agent um, with, uh, different, with one combination to assay the different arms or multiple different combinations. And so to get started, um, one of the first steps really for IMATCH has been the development of a pilot protocol. And this is um, uh, to assess the feasibility of doing this prospective uh, profiling uh, of the tumor mutation burden and gene expression profiles in tumors uh, and incorporating them in a clinical trial. And so uh, the IMATCH uh, planning group has designed this BICASO study, which is a phase two study of combining cabozantinib and nivolumab in patients with advanced solid tumors and uh, IO refractory melanoma or head and neck squamous cell carcinoma have been selected. And these will be stratified by tumor biomarkers. So patients with primary or acquired resistance with anti-PD-1 based therapy will be enrolled on uh, BICASO. A tumor biopsy will be assayed for the tumor mutation burden and uh, the inflammation score. And they'll be subgrouped into these four different categories. Um, and then enrolled on a trial of cabozantinib plus nivolumab, 60 patients with melanoma and 60 patients with head and neck squamous cell carcinoma will be enrolled on this study. The hypothesis here is that um, molecular characterization based on TMB and the gene expression profile will be feasible for upfront patient stratification. And the combination of anti-PD-1 and a VEGF inhibitor will be effective in patients who have progressed on checkpoint inhibitor therapy, and that the response rate will be different among tumors with different tumor mutational burden and T-cell inflammation status. 
And uh, just to highlight here from some of uh, prior work that has been performed, we know that, for example, both in melanoma and in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, we should find uh, subsets of patients with tumors from each of these four groups that we are, uh, that we are uh, planning to analyze. So where are we now? Uh, IMATCH, really the idea for IMATCH um, and uh, NCI's uh, leadership in developing IMATCH really started early on after the Swag Immunotherapeutics Committee was, uh, was formed in, in the fall of 2018. An initial workshop uh, was, was held bringing together thought leaders to talk about IMATCH planning and its development. And um, the IMATCH pilot now is currently uh, under review at uh, the NCI, the protocol. So um, uh, we'll, we'll hope to have some updates soon on, on the status of that. Eventually, after the IMATCH pilot has been conducted, then uh, the planning for further development of the broader IMATCH trial to include multiple trials and multiple sub protocols will really uh, get underway. So just a couple of perspectives on biomarkers in immune oncology trials from, from some of the things that we've uh, I've observed over the past uh, couple of years working uh, in, in, this, in this role and, and thinking about biomarkers. Um, there are, we know that for many of the biomarkers, there are multiple assays and selection of the assay can be really challenging. Um, and I think some of the efforts like the Friends of Cancer Research TMB harmonization effort and also some of the efforts that have been done to compare PDL1 IHC antibodies and work that you know, David Rim and Fred Hirsch have done, for example, these uh, can be really helpful for understanding uh, which type of assays uh, one might want to run and, um, and, and use in their trials. I think also um, the, one of the things that is um, really important is that when selecting assays and when selecting which biomarkers to include in trials, there are a lot of details that um, we don't often think about in first uh, as a first step, but are really important. Of course, the question being addressed is, is critical. So which is the uh, best biomarker to answer the question that we're interested in, in asking? But then there, there are also some other uh, elements that, that come up. And one of them is tissue availability. How much tissue are we really going to be able to obtain for a certain study? And, and what types of assays then can we run on, it, uh, run on the, that tissue? Another important factor is the turnaround time that is needed for the assay to be performed, especially if we want to enroll patients on the study um, uh, based on information that comes from the analysis of the assay. Some of the um, assays that we run are, are very complex. If one is doing whole exome sequencing, one has to, uh, uh, that takes some time through, for example, extraction of the DNA, uh, sequencing, data analysis, and, and that doesn't include the uh, processing of the tissue um, and shipping of the tissue to different places. So this is a really important factor to think about very carefully and in a, a detailed manner. Uh, another uh, issue is that many of the biomarkers might have cutoffs that need to be considered. And um, there might be different cutoffs or more appropriate for individual biomarkers and in different disease settings. And so really gaining insight into the best approach and, and discussing these things with people is important. Also, the logistics of collection, shipping, and, and how to process the materials is another uh, factor that is really important. I think one of, the, one of the things that I certainly have learned is that there's an incredible knowledge base and infrastructure within SWOG, the NCI, and beyond that has certainly is instrumental in developing IMATCH and uh, that can be leveraged uh, for trial planning and execution. So there's a lot of information out there already, a lot of resources and tools and um, uh, knowing where to find them and, uh, and having that information can be helpful and can, can also facilitate the development of uh, a trial and a protocol. 
Uh, I'd also like to just point out a couple of things um, as, you know, thinking about translational medicine and SWOG IO trials in general and thinking of the future. I think um, that a couple of things come to mind, um, and one of them came up in one of our committee calls that we had just recently as we were thinking about uh, uh, resistance uh, to therapy, and that SWOG trials really represent a remarkable opportunity to collect and analyze specimens at resistance to therapy, including acquired resistance which uh, represents a major gap in our knowledge. But SWOG trials are, are really, they're, they ha include a lot of patients. And so if there is the opportunity to study uh, tumors uh, at progression, study and collect tumors at progression, and also to incorporate and really study and collect tumors at the time of acquired resistance, um, the, one can, I think, learn a lot and, um, the, SWOG, uh, investing in this as we think of the future is, um, is something that I think we should think about more and more in, in our trials. There are also, in addition to some of the you know, biomarkers that we talked about today and some of the many other biomarkers that are being looked at in immune oncology studies, um, there are lots of other things that we can think about too in terms of TM and in, in sort of in the future, um, present and future in SWOG IO trials, incorporating uh, artificial intelligence in, in our analysis of data, multiplexed imaging. Um, there are um, lots of uh, approaches to do multiplexed imaging and also using that, for example, to um, to study the combinations of uh, immune cells and, and tumor cells and spatially where these are in tumors. Um, examples like um, Kurt Schalper uh, has, and, and David Rim and Inessa Wistuba all here within SWOG have um, examples of uh, abilities to, to perform this multiplexed imaging. Functional characterization of immune cells in tumors. I think that's a direction to think about going forward as we can collect more specimens, collect fresh specimens, um, and uh, understand the biologies of these immune cells. And finally, um, another thing that I'd like to challenge uh, the group to think about is how we can leverage trials and specimens to generate models for functional and experimental studies. And I, here I have uh, a, a, a picture of some uh, 3D cultures, but one can think of humanized mice in addition to 3D cultures. And we have great partnerships with Cold Spring Harbor Labs and with Jackson Labs um, that could potentially be um, uh, very, very valuable for uh, incorporating these uh, biological studies as well um, in SWOG IO trials. So finally, um, I, just to uh, close up and, and tell you a couple more things about the SWOG IO committee, our immunotherapy committee, um, uh, we're developing IMATCH together with NCI, including the initial pilot study, as you heard. Uh, one of our objectives is to facilitate IO trial design and inclusion of TM in IO studies across diseases and develop collaborative projects to study immunotherapy resistance. We have monthly meetings on the first Friday of each month. Um, and you can email us uh, to be added to the distribution list. Uh, and if you have questions or if you have ideas uh, um, for some of these things that we've talked about. And I'd really like to um, uh, I'm, I have a picture here of Siwen Wuliskoven, who is a, a great uh, co-chair of this committee. And we work together a lot. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to work with her. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge many uh, the people involved in, in some of the work that I told you about today. We have many representatives from SWOG. It's a fantastic and committed group. Um, and uh, the NCI, incredible uh, work uh, with, with all of the uh, collaborators at NCI and nationwide. We've uh, relied on subject experts, uh, worked with NCTN, other NCTN representatives. And so um, it definitely takes a village uh, to do these studies and, uh, uh, and takes everybody's expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. That was uh, quite a tour de force. Um, wonderful presentation, a lot of work being done. Uh, there is one question uh, in the Q&A box, which is how much tissue is needed 
or eye match? And do you see that as a barrier? Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, that's a, a great question. So for the, the first step, the registration of iMatch, we, um, there is the opportunity of either uh, submitting samples from a fresh biopsy or from archival tissue that has been collected within six months of uh, registration. If uh, a fresh biopsy is, is being performed, we're, we're asking for uh, four FFPE uh, core biopsy specimens. And um, if archival tissue is being collected, we, uh, the preference is, of course, to um, have the block submitted. Um, but there also is the potential of submitting slides with a minimum of 20 uh, freshly cut uh, slides, uh, sections that, uh, that can be submitted. Of course, you know, one of the things that we're very cognizant that um, the amount of tissue and availability of tissue is, uh, is important. So we also have entered into the protocol, the option that if um, there is, if there are fewer than 20 slides that we should be contacted um, to determine whether sufficient material is available. So those are things that we will certainly be looking at. So, uh, so, so we do need some material and uh, we'll be requiring some material, but hopefully, that will uh, not be a barrier, and we have uh, at least consideration for um, for you know not having a super hard cutoff. That if there is enough material, even on fewer slides, that that can be assessed. So that leads to a question that I um, had: is that um, okay? You have twenty slides that you require. Where do those slides go? Do they all go to Westuba's lab for CMAC? Do they go to the NCI? <clears throat> uh, where does uh, one right? So, so, so the process is uh, quite uh, a complex process. So those slides are are going to go to to nationwide, and then from from nationwide material is going to be um, then shipped to the NCI for the analysis. So. The, and and that, that really goes to my, um, my comment in my presentation about the, how critically important thinking through the timing is and getting everybody on the same page so that all of those steps are considered and have been thought through. And I think that colleagues at, at NCI and colleagues at Nationwide and colleagues at SWOG, everybody has been fantastic about really thinking through all of the logistics and all of these individual steps. And what is the turnaround time in regards to getting the phenotype or genotype or both for an individual patient? Let's say you do a biopsy of a head and neck tumor on a Monday. How long would it be until you know if a patient can, is, um, can be enrolled in a trial? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the, um... One of the endpoints of the trial is uh, actually to ex exactly to evaluate the feasibility of doing this molecular characterization. And um, based on both TMB and the gene expression profiling. And uh, we're looking at whether, you know, the, what the success rate is of getting those results within two weeks. So um, looking at, at, at that type of uh, time frame, that, that type of um, end point to, to, to see whether that we can get it within that time frame to be able to, um, to then put a patient on study. And what, and I'm, I'm kind of smiling because that's like the perfect amount of time by the time it goes to the bank and, and you figure out where the 20 slides go, maybe, maybe 20 different places, maybe not. Uh, and then you get some answers back. Um, what do the patient advocates say about waiting two weeks to get an answer on this? Um, I think we, we have um, had conversations uh, with patient advocates in, in, in these discussions. So I think that there's um, an, an understanding of that time frame. Okay, great. No, I didn't want to put you on the spot. I was just thinking that every committee has a patient advocate and, you know, waiting two weeks is really not a lot of time to do all the work that you're doing, but it's an anxious two weeks for the patient who, of course, is 
you know, wants to get things moving. So that was uh, fantastic. Um, now with CMAC, um, at one point it was under Westuba's roof, uh, but now it seems to be spread out among various laboratories. Is that right? So this is, um, so this is actually the biomarker analysis is in work with, um, with MOCA, with NCI, um, the MOCA labs at NCI. So that's okay. where the analysis of these samples are going to be done through. And a lot of bioinformatics, uh, obviously statisticians involved from the start. Um, oh yes, absolutely, absolutely, yes. We've been working with um, the SWOG statistical team from the start. Okay, and I see in the um, chat box, there are a couple of comments that everybody can read for themselves. Uh, everybody should have access to the chat box. Uh, and I wanna ask you one biologic question. Um, as I <clears throat> uh, grew up in Josh Fiddler's department and the tumor microenvironment is everything. And of course, it, the immune the immune system is part of the tumor microenvironment. Um, do you anticipate different responses in different sites? For instance, a head and neck tumor or a, a melanoma, of course, which can spread to various sites, including the CNS. Um, do you anticipate different responses in different microenvironments? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a really uh, critically important question and something that is really interesting. I think that we still need to really get a better understanding of how much the microenvironment influences individual responses at different metastatic sites, also depending on the, the biology and the nature of, uh, of the tumor. I think um, I can talk a little bit from our example and, and from some studies that, that we've been uh, doing and looking at in the context of, of targeted therapies where we, we definitely see that there are some sites that um, have, have, have different responses uh, to, to, to various targeted therapies. Um, in, in the context of lung cancer, for example, we, we see some deeper responses with targeted therapies in, uh, in the chest compared to, for example, in the case of, of liver lesions. Um, so, so I think that that is something that'll be interest, really interesting to look at and uh, be able to study. I'm also curious to see how the profiles, how the gene expression profiles um, differ from different uh, metastatic sites. So not just in terms of the type of disease, but actually if, if sp specimens are collected from different metastatic sites, you know, how to, is there a difference in sort of the distribution or what the gene expression profile looks like? And, and is that related to responses? And we have two more minutes of your time. We'll end right on time, but there are a couple of comments that came into the Q&A box. So you can probably yes. see them yourselves. <clears throat> to the group, what about using liquid biopsies, uh, as we just heard in our second talk, uh, and um, extracellular vesicles, et cetera, are they being uh, looked at um, as part of your biomarker studies? Yeah, these are great questions. So we do have plans to look at circulating uh, tumor DNA. Um, within the context of the study as planned. Uh, we also would like to look at other uh, blood-based markers. So for example, um, cytokines and um, different circulating uh, protein markers and, and inflammation markers. So those are studies that we'll, we'll consider down the line as uh, more exploratory, but the circulating tumor DNA is, is built into the study and will be looked at for sure. And the very last question is more cross-fertilization. The question is any consideration of sharing biomarker analysis from other studies, for instance, lung map. And then we'll, that'll be the last question, I promise. So I'm just trying to understand exactly, oh, if, if we get that information, whether it could be used for a different clinical trial as well. Uh, uh, I can't that, translate that, that but that's, that seems to be a good... Uh, translation from your end, so. So, so. so I think that totally depends on what type of study it is and what the requirements are for the other trial. So if the trial, uh, if, if, if 
if the tr if it can be used, I, I don't see why not. I just uh, it just depends on on what the requirements for individual are for individual studies for individual trials and whether they will allow it, whether the same platform, the same assay is used, or whether they would accept um, uh, assays that are done uh, elsewhere. Okay, well that were that was a wonderful session. I want to thank all the speakers uh, for being on time. They're pre-prepared lectures, but their live Q&A was fantastic. Thank you for uh, the enthusiasm from SWAG with the Q&A and in the chat box. And uh, it is time to move on to the next meeting. So I hope you have time to go from one room to the next. And uh, we hope to see you live uh, in Seattle. We're moving from San Francisco for Seattle for the next meeting. And of course, we all hope to be able to interact with one another and see one another. So thank you all to the speakers. Thanks for the people who um, attended this um, plenary session. And we look forward to uh, great things coming out of all this uh, knowledge you gained today. Thank you all. <laughs>